Welcome to Power of the Tribe podcast. I'm your host, John Connors. I'm also the founder and head instructor of Connors Martial Arts here at Norwood, Mass. We teach Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, Muay Thai, kickboxing, mixed martial arts. And I'm here with my host, Dan Robin. How you doing, Dan? All right. How All you right. doing? About a seven, right? Yeah, I don't know. Perennial. A little, little cranky. <laughs> <laughs> a cranky seven. I'm a little, yeah, a cranky seven. I could see that. That's pretty par for the course yeah. for you, I think, Cranky 7. Yeah. I wouldn't say, like, and also nothing in particular is bugging me. Yeah. I think I'm just becoming cranky. Could we become, you know, you and there crank, has to be this. Everyone, crankier? Everyone knows, everyone knows, like, cranky old man, right? Yeah. Like, so there has to be, you've got to get there, right? Get a little crankier each year. Yeah. A little older, a little crankier. Yeah. I think you're relatively cranky as a <laughs> baseline. Well, let me ask you, here's something from an hour ago. All right. I was thumbing through my phone like some Facebook post or something like this. So there was some meme, just to give you the gist of it, like they gave like uh, employee of the month to someone at Wal- at a Walmart in Illinois. Okay, okay. And it became like a thing. You know how things go viral? So What people, was so attractive about this? Nothing. I, like it just said, huh. but suddenly there was like 80,000 comments or something. Like people started making jokes like, and here, like the literal jokes were like, Oh, she's awesome. And then they would say something outlandish. Like it was uh-huh. like, I, my glasses broke and she carved me a new set of glasses uh-huh. out of a piece of wood. And oh, right. some glass. And they say, oh, someone, I had to go to the bathroom. So she murdered three people ahead of me. And, and I didn't find their jokes funny, though. Okay. It's a problem. So yeah. I'm reading, I'm going through, like those are literal examples. Like yeah. where I'm like, all right. People don't, and yeah. by and large, Dan, I found, don't understand that part of humor. That like, has to be funny. Yeah, they missed that whole part. Yeah. <laughs> like you just have to try to be sort of be a little outrageous. Yeah. yeah. So each thing was sort of like, not so I'm I'm thumbing through it like kind of with a scowl, and yeah. I'm like, and I get you know I stop at some point and I mutter out loud to myself, yeah everybody's a fucking comedian, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> and I said it out loud. Nice. The thing is, my daughter, who I thought was not, that she had her headphones on. So she turns her headphones off and goes, sorry, what did you say? <laughs> and I had to be like, no, no, like I wasn't talking to you. You're lovely like, and it's a daughter. She's like, didn't yeah. you say, yeah, she's like, didn't you say something? And I'm like, and this is when I realized like the self-evaluation. I'm like, no, I'm just uh, muttering at my phone. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? So like I had that moment of like, I'm getting pretty cranky, right? Like I'm, I'm like muttering out loud at my phone and then it's like a mean little mutter mm. about like a a meme you know that's what I mean? kind of like, like the 2020 version of get off my lawn or it's that's what i was keeping thinking, the right? kids ball because it came over onto your yard yeah, yeah. that's exactly what it felt like to me and i don't think i would have noticed if i didn't have to actually look up at my daughter mm. and say no nah, I'm, I'm just yelling at the phone mm. so that's cranky right I wasn't well, planning on talking, mentioning that, but we just happened to I be talking about I think it's cranky, but crankiness. I think social media may be the most evil thing that's happened to the human race. I, it just started to dawn You've on said me. that theory before, right? Yeah. That it's like really, really bad. I think it's really, really bad. Yeah. And in, in which way are you focusing on? Because there's the echo chamber. No. Here's what I think. I, I'll break it down for you. So our, our fans of this podcast understand we talk about the selfish gene often. Right. And the selfish gene is about you know, we have these genes inside us that want to get to the next generation. They want to survive and replicate. And to do that, increasing our status is probably the fastest and most effective way to do that. So humans are ultra concerned with status. And I think Facebook and social media takes that fundamental part of, the, of human nature and just amplifies it to an insane level. And would level. you say it's already too strong in us exactly. and it's already yeah. sort of at an unhealthy level yeah even without it i think so and now this thing is amplifying amplifying it, it. literally your status update they call yeah. it a status right. and uh, so I, i've started posting less and less on on all platforms because of it because it just doesn't feel good i mean can you post something dan without it being bragging of some sort it's almost impossible isn't it like i posted yeah. Usually you post things, here's my kid, He, she, her, they did something great, they graduated, like you're proud of them. So you're yeah, kind of right, promoting right. your own genes and how fancy they are. You're kind of bragging <laughs> a little bit, right? And even the one of the last posts I did, 
uh, Tap Cancer Out. They sent us this nice poster. We we're one of the leading academies for raising money for cancer research. They sent us this big poster, and I thought, gee, that's so wonderful. And all the all students who went out and raised the money and competed. Uh, so I took a picture of it where I'm holding it, and I posted it on Facebook. It seems like the thing to do, right? Yeah. And I really wanted to do it to... It makes the academy look good. Right? Yeah, but I, I wanted to show it to the people who contributed right. and, and, and who participated. Right, but it's, I'm also, I, it makes the academy look good in a legitimate way. Like, it sh the academy right. deserves to look good. But right? even it's then, like I, feel like, I feel like yeah. I'm bragging a little right. bit. You know what <laughs> I mean? So it's, I mean, like, even the most straightforward post, it has a little bit of a, a vibe of bragging, right? Yeah, it's hard not to. But the, the only, if there are people on Facebook aren't bragging, then they're doing the opposite, right? They're telling like this horrendous story about themselves. Yeah. That happened. That's. <laughs> you mean for sympathy or for. S I, I don't know why they do it. Yeah. It grosses me out sometimes. I'm like, why are they posting I definitely this? notice sometimes I laugh when it's like the innocent post, but they're clearly trying to brag. Like, like some version of like. The humble brag. Yeah. Or, yeah. or they'll be like. Oh, here I am by the pool, but like clearly they look really good. And oh, like, right. Oh, I just love, I just love it here at the beach. And like clearly it's a picture yeah. where they look really good. And yeah, it's like, well, you're obviously that's why you posted the picture. Yeah. Why like, else would yeah. you, right? <laughs> it's um. So it's that's all right a, to brag sometimes a little bit, by the way. I, I think mean, so, yeah. but I, here's the real problem, Dan. That's you know that's pseudo esteem. So I have friends like you and other people in my life. And if I manage to work hard and accomplish something, if if I get esteem from you folks, well, well that was g good for you, man. Way to yeah. way to go. That's real. But when I'm on Facebook, that's not really real. You know what I mean? It's 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 fake. It's pseudo esteem. So I can get wrapped up into, or any person can get wrapped up into pseudo esteem. Where how many likes did I get? How come I didn't get more comments? I only got ten likes on that. I deserve more. And you can fall into this trap where you're competing for Facebook likes or social. Uh, media likes and retweets or comments and it's not healthy I don't think at all that's right yeah. because I never felt like I don't know much about like number of likes or number of retweets mm. or number so I never fell into it but that's just again age you know mm. I bet with our kids they're a lot more aware of it although I have trouble picturing Rory being aware of it to be honest but like I don't think he he leans into it as much but yeah you, you but can I bet I never even really thought that much about it but I bet each post Instagram post or whatever it is with my or Twitter post with my kids they're noticing how many retweets there are and how many likes there are and I think in general people do yeah that's yeah. the sort of the dopamine loop that keeps them doing it and I'd be don't you notice because you have a business so I could see you trying like just keeping note of like who's who liked your post you know just because it's oh, not yeah. personal you know what I mean you're sort of yeah if it's something for for the academy sort of like did people how many people responded to this yeah and what i found is when you have a group picture with a lot of people and you tag a lot of them those posts get the most likes right. and comments of course but uh but otherwise yeah i don't know I, but i don't want to be doing things for facebook in a way you know what i mean right. it's kind of something really creepy about it and i think probably not healthy um and i find myself when i do post on facebook then I start looking at my feed, and time goes by, and I think, why did I look at this? And then I don't feel that good either about it, right? So do you think, so this effect of everyone, do you think it is hurting self-esteem or giving yeah. up? Because you're, so you're getting distracted by fake self, I wouldn't say self-esteem, fake esteem, you know, this pseudo-esteem. That's not healthy. If you think about it, Dan, if you could limit yourself to your sort of, sanctum sanctorum your inner group of people that you respect and you share your most important values with you want to you do want to impress those people so to impress is maybe a strong word but if one of those people came to you if i came to you someday and i said dan uh you're kind of screwing up over here with what you're doing in this yeah. then you're like oh that's that's important feedback for you right, right. but if you're just chasing almost anonymous feedback on social media to guide your behavior that's probably not good at all it's probably dangerous and right unhealthy. and to your point prior to social media you kind of that is what everyone was doing they were kind of mostly focusing on the people close to them i think so yeah right yeah and if you and if you look at natural history it's just your tribe 
Yeah. But when you go online, your tribe is just expanding to, to places that it makes no sense, you know. It's people you don't even know. So it's crazy. Um, yeah, I don't even know what fame was 100,000 years ago, right? <laughs> it's like you had fame within your tribe probably. That's about it, right? Yeah. There was no such thing, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's why we said fame is like a fake. It's a weird thing. It's like that's why people are like, crying when they see the Beatles or seeing someone fit you know oh, like right. because it's like it's an unnatural level of tribal status yeah it's super like, normal you're know, like what what we're designed for is like this person is respected by all hundred mm. people mm. in our village mm. and these are like people that have millions of fans and it like overloads the sense overloads like, the yeah. nervous system yeah. I, you're absolutely right Dan yeah if you think about it you had a tribe of 100 150 that would be about it and you probably didn't never even had consensus. Like somebody could be a great leader, and they're like, "Yeah, 120 of us think he's great. 30 aren't that happy about him. That's as <laughs> famous as anybody got, as popular as anybody got, right?" Right. So modern fame is this unnatural thing of people being like, "Oh my God, do you know who that is?" Like Did, there probably never was that before. You yeah. watch that documentary, Wild Wild Country, on Netflix yeah. about Osho. So Osho was this cult leader, and he, he's originated in india and then they moved to oregon and he ended up having maybe ten thousand followers in oregon and what would happen is w when he would do a presentation in a giant tent with five thousand people or thousands of people a new person who wasn't indoctrinated would come in and when they see five five thousand people go berserk over a guy like he's the beatles in one yeah. person there's a certain percentage of our population that it just flips a switch on them and they're in I like think it's a large percentage. Though. You think it's a large percentage? Yeah. I mean, it's not me, but it's I think me. it's a no. lot of other people. A lot of people are like, we're, we're not going home. We're right. staying here. And we're was it, we said this before. I think we talked about this documentary. He seemed very plain, right? Like he seemed like so uncompelling. Like he wasn't like Unbelievable, handsome Dan. or interesting. No. Or oh, smart he was homely, or... googly eyed, yeah. right? Frog eyed. <laughs> uh, he just said nonsense. Sort of Chauncey Gardner. But now he just stepped into it. Uh, I think he, when he originated in India, I think when people went, Americans or Westerners went to India, they were cap, they were just swept up in the environment, this novel environment. And it's human nature where you're in an exotic place, you just assume there's a lot of value there. And uh, then he just was like law of large numbers. Like he, he got enough followers that became a snowball effect, and then he just started pulling in people left and right after that. And then, th of course, he went to Hollywood and started getting some famous people, some celebrities, which is seems to be a common tract for guru types. Right. Like Bikram from Bikram's Yoga, he went to Hollywood as well, and you get some celebs doing your thing and buying into your guru-ness. And that's and another thing. People there'll, freak out. There'll be a lot of people for that same reason. They'll be like, if that person... yeah. Is into them. If Barbara Streisand's doing it, I have to do it. Yeah. yeah. They're like m force multipliers to celebrities. Yeah. Yeah. Because, or even, so even if you don't have a celebrity, if you're like, if you walk in and you're like, wait, look at all those really beautiful people that are just yeah, infatuated with this guy. I'm not even as good looking as those people. Like, mm. if they're into them and they look like they're above me, mm. I must be, you know, like he must yeah. be really up high. Yeah. You know, and then it snowballs. I think it's all about status and um, people inferring genetic superiority when they see somebody being worshipped by thousands of people. Sad to say, that's that really seems to work with humans, right? Yeah. It's gross, but true. I'm trying, Dan, to... And it's obviously a fruitless endeavor, but my idea is I, I don't want to fear losing status at all. Yeah. And I'm like, what would my life be like if I never feared losing any status? Uh and it, I think the problem with it is it sneaks up on you like you're you guard your status. And you're not paying attention. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> right. And then I thought the flip side of not fearing losing status, Dan, is not desiring gaining status. Right. Is that the flip side of it? I would say I don't I'm not sure you could do. Yeah, I think you have to do both. Right. I don't think so you can do one. Does that serve me to not desire to gain status? Because when you do gain status, there's something that kind of comes with it. Right. You do get a little bit of wealth and power when your status increases. I don't know. Yeah. I think we've talked about this before. I, yeah. I think there's a way to walk the line. Right. There's a yeah. way to try to do things that 
be productive enough, get enough status in order to live comfortably, and just but not, not worry about if it doesn't drive work yourself out. berserk right. with it, right? Yeah, I was. Someone was talking about self esteem and saying they put it in a way that that was interesting to me. That was something like a lot of people, in a major way, define themselves by some i forgot the exact term but it was like by a shortcoming or by a failure or by a setback in their life like they take the major setbacks in their life and that's they use it to define themselves and it's a really self-esteem killer like the one thing and if what i mean is example well so if you're even if you're a very successful athlete but you didn't win the belt Mm. you might be like that's you might every time you think about your athletic career be like Mm. i didn't i was the guy who didn't get the belt Mm. Or I'm the one, and I guess people we do it to other people, right? Because we'll be like Charles Barkley and Patrick Ewing. The thing is, they never won the title. Hmm. It's like, and the, it becomes a defining feature, and it's sort of a really negative way to define someone. Like for all the success, and that's for successful people. Hmm. So now, for more normal people, you might be like, whatever you did in your career, you might define yourself by like, I never really got to whatever position you thought you I never got to VP I never got to CEO like whatever your setback was that becomes defining or a divorce right you can be like I really messed up my relationship I didn't work hard enough on it or a kid that's not doing well or negative things in your life Hmm. people take that to be um, if not me if not a major one maybe even the defining Hmm. characteristic of themselves and it's very unhealthy yeah and um I hadn't really thought of it that way, right? Because I think everyone does it to some extent. Like, do they? You can have a pretty good life and still sort of be like, well, here's the thing I never did. And it can... I guess some people would call it a framing. How are you framing your experiences? Yeah. You can frame them in a negative way, right? Don't you think it's pretty common? Uh, it might be. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I hadn't thought about it, Dan. But um, maybe, yeah. I think... Probably the cure to all of this is what I keep reminding myself and I have to remind myself is uh, I'm here to develop myself. So when I go to the academy, I say, how can I develop myself? How can I develop my students? And I, I think that focus on development breaks you free from what you're talking about, that uh, obsessing about some loss or some moment, you know, some experience. Yeah, or a shortcoming or a setback or... Yeah, but do you think it's part of it is because you sort of see yourself as in development instead of like I am? Yeah, this. Yeah, right? but like, uh, here, here's what I think. Let me elaborate. I think Dan, you're absolutely right. You can focus on events and successes and losses and use those to evaluate yourself to come up with a metric for yourself, or you can just focus on developing yourself. Yeah, what am I doing today? I'm developing myself. I'm getting better in these different ways. And it's a little bit of a a mindfulness exercise, but I think when you can focus on development, you don't have the brain space to start focusing on successes or losses or whatever uh, 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 failures you had or however you want to describe them. And it just puts you in a better place too, Dan. I find it because if I'm always evaluating myself based on my outcomes or my most recent outcomes that's a lot of pressure yeah. right and it limits your development because if you it puts you in a place where you're afraid to lose if you're afraid to lose you can't really develop because development involves experimentation you know what i mean it's like leaning one way and leaning the other way you know what i mean overdoing and underdoing like you have to tinker and you have to experiment to find the path to development and if you're playing tight because you don't want to lose every day uh, that that just has to limit your development, I think, pretty significantly. And it f- feels liberating to me when I can get into that headspace where I'm here to develop today or I look at my students, I'm like, how can I help this guy develop? It gives me the right answers for my life and for my classes and for, for that day and for the training. You know, I had a student come in, Mr. Chad Lightfoot. I'm doing private lessons with him right now. He's such a great guy. Wasn't he out for quite a while? or is He it was out for a while. And he's coming back, and we're doing private lessons, just him and I. And he came in the other day, and uh, I might have made some comment that I didn't sleep well or something. And he goes, oh, today might be the day I can beat you. 
And I'm like, no, 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 it's, we're here to develop you, man. That's what it's about. And the more you focus on beating me, it's probably going to distract you and limit your development, actually. But we've had, I think we just had two lessons, but it's been very productive already. But I sort of ruthlessly go in there with how can I help this guy develop? And I think it's improved my teaching process pretty significantly. Right. And you've always advocated for learning, too. Like, even if someone wanted to beat you, the best way to go about it is to just develop yourself to work yeah, on skills exactly. and like not to think about beating yeah. you. If you're focusing on beating me today, you're probably not developing yourself most effectively. If you just focus on developing yourself, sooner or later you're going to be better than me and beat me. It's inevitable. You know, so that's really the... And they say the that a lot in sports where they say like different things where they're like, if you think I'm going to knock this guy out, you won't. Like just focus on mm. performing as best you can or like if I, you think I'm going to hit a home run often you can't like just try focus on mm. getting your swing properly and seeing mm. the ball, like doing everything right focus on what you're supposed to do and getting better rather than like these immediate outcomes like I think you're right Dan yeah and I think I think s athletics especially is weird that way sometimes if you focus too much on the thing that you want it, it's harder to get there yeah we talk about a that's probably one of our most common themes here, Dan, is focusing on the process instead of the immediate result. Uh, I was doing a private lesson with crew Mark Delagrati yesterday in Muay Thai, and, um, and I felt really good. He's like, wow, your, your right hand feels so good today. And he's like, I notice you're doing this. You're kind of leaning your head this way, and you're turning your punch over. He's telling me all these things that I'm doing. And actually, Dan, the only thing I was focusing on is landing solidly with my first two yeah. knuckles. And oddly enough, just by focusing on that, it sort of guided my body to, to do all the proper things. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's very indirect, but it ends up working out. But if I had to focus on all like three different things, oh, I'm gonna lean this way, I'm gonna come over, and I'm gonna do this, and I might not have been able to get there as fast as I did, you know? Yeah, I think, don't you think that comes up in jujitsu a lot too, where especially something like a pass, or an escape where you're like, there's eight steps to this. I, I think we've talked before, like way back when it used to be taught more this way, like these eight steps to, to escape or to pass. And it's very hard to, you know, when you're going mm. live because everyone's so doing something It takes you out of your people, natural flow and your yeah, rhythm and too. People yeah. do things that aren't right. quite what you're, you know, like, well, what if, what if his foot comes over and like mm. now that now my, st but right. sometimes you could pat, you were like practicing these intricate passes and you're like, you could do better, especially earlier on in your jiu-jitsu where you're like, just get your knee next to his hip. However yeah. you can get your knee, if you can get your knee next to his hip, I think that's very good, Dan. Yeah. You know, and, like, and then you actually kind of do, I mean, day one or you just, won't. Or just get to a good half guard on top. Yeah. And with very little instruction, sometimes you can figure it out. Your body moves the right way to get there. Yeah. I think that's very good advice, definitely. And the escaping... My mantra now is we're going to escape inside out. We're going to get our limbs on the inside. So if you just keep doing that, it it leads you to your proper technique and escape. Instead of eight different steps, like you're saying, when something happens at step three where the guy's thwarting you and you can't get to step four, you're like, now what the hell do I do? Yeah. But if you only have one thing to think about, probably you can improvise better and get the result that you want. Definitely. So what I'm doing in my privates too dan is so with chad he has a certain guard he likes to play a spider guard so we're basically instead of me teaching him techniques we just get into it so i he gets to the point where he's got great grips and he's almost about to sweep me and then we go live from there and we see what happens and maybe he sweeps me but he doesn't end up in the perfect position and he gets reswept and we're like so how can you sweep me now and get in a good position and we just sort of build on what's already there that's working. You know what I mean? Right. I find it really effective. And sometimes you can find one little, oh, boy, hey, this is a little mistake you've been doing for years. Just keep your elbow in here instead of having it out, and suddenly they're 15% better, like in one lesson, just like that. So, uh, yeah, I've been doing a lot of my teaching. And Do you try to train yourself in a similar way? Like, going by uh, through positions and seeing if a little bit it. yeah we're doing some backwards teaching now did i tell explain this to you before maybe so let's say we're doing a half guard pass dan so i get a good half guard chest to chest i got a far side underhook 
I got a cross face. Now one way to pass is I sort of lower my hip and then I get my like my shoelaces up on their thigh to pry my leg out of the half guard. Can I don't know if you can visualize yeah. that. Then I kind of shimmy my leg out and maybe I get to mount or go to side control. So what we started doing with our students is we get them all the way to the point where they're in half guard. They have the cross face. They have the underhook. They have their shoelaces up in the guy's thigh, and then they go live from there. So they're like 90% done the pass, and now we're going to wrestle live. And what happens is they pretty quickly, you know, within five minutes or so, they can finish that pass live against a fully resisting opponent. Now we back it up, and so we say— take your, your shoelaces off his thigh. Bingo. And we just back it up that way and do that for half an hour with that one pass, and then when they leave there, they can actually do that pass pretty well against a resisting opponent. So we're getting a big kick out of training that way, of course, you know. Um, and we want to limit – here's what I noticed, too, in teaching Dan for jiu-jitsu. I think I want to limit the presentation time where the teacher is speaking to the group of students. You've taught before. You understand that people only have a limited amount <laughs> of attention. So if you start talking too long and you don't have a clear, compelling message and a point, you start losing people. Yeah. And – Actually, I don't know. I, let me ask it a question. Yeah. Do you, if it's the, a parallel, when I teach in front of a class, mm -hmm. there'd be like a moment where like my brain would almost disengage. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that my voice to me started sounding like rah, 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 mm. rah. like I'm like, I'm just talking too long. Yeah, definitely. Do you know what I mean? And like yeah. it's it's it must be from the feedback, like the expressions on everyone's face. Yeah. And I, it's like it goes from like feeling like I'm having a conversation, like explaining yeah. something to like. I've somehow entered a drone. Like yeah. A dr like I'm somehow just blabbing now. Yep. And I notice I don't it. Know how this ha like I have to stop. Like I have to like break it up. Be like, I, I have to do something now. Start clapping your hands. Do any any freaking thing. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're checked. They checked out. Yeah. When I was a kid, um, we were raised Catholic, and I remember going to these Catholic masses, Dan, and talk about a trance state. You go in there. These priests back then, Dan. I don't know if they still are. I'm sure they are. They're like tenured professors. They can't get fired. Right. I mean, they can commit crimes and not <laughs> even get fired. I mean, horrible, horrific. I don't even go into that. But so these guys would be out there and they go, and uh, when Paul on the road, to the and it's just I dare any person to stay awake. It was brutal, and you would just fade out, man. Um, so when I teach my classes, I'm like the presentation part has got to be on point. It's got to be crisp. And then we do the active recall. So if there's five steps in some technique I'm teaching, I run through it about three times. I tell them the comp two, one or two common mistakes. And then we go around the room and we say, Dan, what do I have to do first? And you go, um, grab the wrist. And when people know you're going to go through and ask people, and, and I wait right. in an uncomfortable time for them to try to come up with an answer. Right. And then that people would be like, I do not want to be there going, I don't know. It's like a flashback to high school when you get called on. And yeah, but that friggin' works. And then yeah. everyone's dialed in. And I've adjusted it. I used to ask the top students so they would give me the right answers. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, no, I got to ask the bottom students, the white belts, the newest people, what do I do next, Steve? And then that puts the pressure on them and they'll pay better attention. It's for their own good. And yeah. then they... They then they remember the steps so they can start drilling it properly immediately. Um, then I found so keep the group presentation brief, use that active recall. I also emphasize any principles like inside out escaping. Then we drill it a little bit, and once everybody can walk through a drill speed, then we get into the live training where I said, we're like, we're going to get to the 90% done of this pass, and we're going to go live now. We're going to see what the hell happens. And um, so they're getting a lot of active jujitsu training. It's the best way to, to learn. I, and I thought about it, Dan. Martial arts isn't designed to be taught to a group of people. It's really a one-on-one -on -one thing. Like when you have an Olympic athlete in some sport, they're not in a, a room with 20 other people practicing the yeah. sport. You know what I mean? You have trainers and coaches, and it's about them. And I think – we can convert our classroom experience into that. You know, if we have 10 people in the class, I get that group presentation and then I get five groups of two that are now training. And then I go, and then I can go over to the two and give the guy the help he needs in that moment. You know what I mean? Individually. 
without wasting anyone else's time. Now, I've seen some classes where a teacher will be droning on a little bit, and I've seen students, they start by paying attention, then you see them sit down and their shoulders slump, then they're resting on their hand. Next thing you know, they're in full Burt Reynolds recline, like their yeah. hand on their head, like laid out, and they are not paying attention. On a bare skin rug, right. naked. Yeah. yeah, and they're not paying attention. And you got to look what, for is that. that. Do you think that could be happening to our listeners right now? That's <laughs> <laughs> Basically, Dan, this yeah. is a one-hour drone, this yeah. whole goddamn thing. <laughs> yeah. All right, everybody, pay attention out there. Hey, wake up. Yeah. What, do, what did we last yeah. say? What was the last thing I said? We should make calls to listeners. We should, yeah. <laughs> but, Dan, it's, it's been exciting to do some of these private lessons and do some of yeah. these limited classes because I have a renewed enthusiasm and passion for the way we're teaching and how we're teaching, and I, and I can see the results already. So, um, Yeah, it sounds great. Yeah, I feel really good about it. And, and you know, Dan, it's important. Like, the method you use to teach is so important, yeah. you know? And I think some instructors d never even think about that. You know, there's I see a couple different dangers that some instructors, the path they go down. One is they want to be a guru. And once they start going down that path, man, their teaching just sucks. And the problem is new students don't know that it sucks because yeah, a lot of people, judge. they can't judge. And they're affected by the whole guru tactics that we employed. And I think some of these guys don't even know they're employing these guru tactics, but they do. Right. And You're saying it's not even like intentional. I, I think it's an unconscious thing yeah. because when people start revering you like a guru, I think for a lot of guys, a lot of teachers, a lot of people, that's very rewarding. It's like, whoa, look at the esteem these people are yeah. giving me, man. They're almost in yeah. awe of me. So now the game becomes not to develop my students. The game as becomes much of that as you let can. me develop as much awe in my audience as possible. I want these people to friggin' revere me. That's the goal. And then you're not developing the students anymore. And um, I was listening to this one guy on YouTube, instructor, I won't say his name, and he seems very popular based on the number of views he has, and he's the total guru package, Dan. And I'm looking at him. I can't tell. I think he's been training less than I have, I'm pretty sure, but I don't even think the guy's ever competed. But he's somehow going around the world doing these seminars, and he's got the guru attitude, and that guru attitude works on some people big time. They eat it up. They're yeah. just like... This guy's a guru. I can't get enough of this. And I think they unwittingly think that he must be a genius by, they're inferring genius by his attitude and his sort of some of his mannerisms and tactics, right? So here's one of the things that he suggested. And I notice what they do is, we talked about this before, have very strong opinions. Right. So sometimes this guy has very strong opinions about stuff that's not even meaningful. You know yeah. what I mean? That really doesn't matter. But like, oh, this is sort of the convention. That's awful. I would never do that. That's awful. Wrong, wrong, wrong. And it's like, well, you might not do it, but it's right. it's not <laughs> wrong. It's just right. something you wouldn't want to do. Here's the other thing he suggested. He came. He told this story. That's to me. Let me. I'm going to tell you the story, Dan. Tell me if you think this story smells as bad as it smelled to me. Okay. So he said there was some ping pong champion, table tennis champion, right? And this guy would play with his belly at the edge of the table, I mean, at a world-class level, supposedly, where they're hitting this ball so hard and so fast, and the ball's doing so many maneuvers that nobody else could play belly to the table. They're always, like, far back from the table where they have these, you know, these really far, powerful volleys. So you can picture that, right? Right. So they said, this guy, here's one of his premises that makes you want to slam your head into the wall. He goes, there's no such thing as talent. He goes, so, <laughs> so this guy, they go, he must have reflexes that are above everybody else in the world. So, Dan, they measured his reflexes, and they were just average. Well, first of all, what is the methodology that's yes. measuring this guy's reflexes, and how do you know that they're quote-unquote average? How many thousands of people's reflexes, whatever that means, you've measured, and you know this guy has ordinary average reflexes? I mean... It, it's just BS right from the jump, right? And the thing that somebody has no... So high-level ping pong with average reflexes, I'm sure, would be impossible. Right off but how are you measuring it, then? I don't even yeah. know what they're talking about. Like, what's the device? 
are they sticking you with a needle are they is there some kind of laser thing timing you see a light you got to do something I, d- I don't know i don't believe the story for a moment and and the thing about no talent well first of all if you have any experience in athletics or as a coach you know that here's how i define talent dan the ability to learn the movement faster than average there's some people you just show them something once and they can replicate it and other people maybe they have to practice it 10 times what's the average whatever the average might be and then there's other people that have to do it 10 times as much as the average that's talent the ability to develop yourself faster than the average person it of course it exists that's not even physical attributes there's physical attributes such as speed power explosiveness right but then there's just talent, the ability to learn some realm, some domain faster than somebody else. That's talent. So to say there's no such thing as talent is just manifestly wrong and absurd. So then he said, so the story about the guy playing ping pong with his belly to the table. Well, where he grew up, the ping pong table was in a really small room. So he was forced. He didn't have room. He only had room to squeeze in between the table and the wall and play ping pong. So he developed this unbelievable ability to play belly to the table. Maybe he did. Sounds like an apocryphal story. It sounds like it probably doesn't really exist. But how, he's using that story to prove that talent doesn't exist. I mean, yeah. it's so dumb, but it's a colorful story, a memorable story. I remembered the story hearing it once. So annoying. So this is part of the guru you're saying? This is part of the guru thing. Come up with like some colorful tales of wisdom. And come up with a colorful story. Uh, not even a tale, Then This is a real story. Yeah. This really happened. And science-based. Up, oh, they measured average. They measured it. They measured it. How did they measure it? You know what I mean? Complete BS. Um, so then he goes on to say, now, if you want to learn how to defend leg locks, Dan, you know what you should do? You should wear leg locks like heel hooks and things. Instead of training no gi with shorts and everything, train with pants and boots on. So that it's harder to escape. So it's harder. I mean, he's like, he takes this dopey concept and totally butchers it where i'm sure you know because you have a phd in psychology there's just that sort of what do they call the zone of proximal development zagotsky is in that what he's talking about where you make something difficult but not too difficult right i mean if you follow the boots and pants method then to be a great marathoner I, i would just throw in a couple I just car- carry a backpack with 300 pounds in it and yeah, run 26, right. run 52 miles every suit day. Of armor. Yeah. yeah, wear a suit of armor and run 52 <laughs> miles every day. By the time it comes to run a marathon, it's only 26. You'll, you'll beat everybody. Yeah. I mean, it's the dopiest, non-scientific guru baloney. And never mind, Dan, that if I have boots on, how I would escape wearing a boot is very different than if I have a bare well, that's foot. That's one of the main things, right? Yeah. Like your whole technique would be different. whole right? technique would be different. I mean... But this is the type of BS that gurus can spew out there and people eat it up. They're like, I never thought of that. And then, you know, after that seminar, there were people out there wearing boots and trying to leg lock each other and pants. You know what I mean? Yeah. But you need to probably have a certain amount of experience and a certain mindset to to disagree with someone that's, you know, it's pretty powerful. When right. You got to be educated. You have to know about if you're this. brand new to the sport. You don't know. You, know? you don't know. But if you had some background in education and that kind of zone of proximal development, you'd be like, wait, well, wait a minute. I want it to be hard, but not too hard, right? Y- you would realize, like, yeah. that's complete nonsense. Like, I don't have to test that theory of wearing boots and pants. You know what I mean? I just know that that doesn't make any sense. And, and as a side note, that's why when somebody's good at jujitsu, sometimes when they train with somebody who's not as good as them, they can position the training so they can enter that zone of proximal development because they they control the situation so much they can put themselves there and then they can really develop themselves does that make sense yeah yeah it's like if i knew leg locks much better than you i'm like well let dan get a straight ankle lock on me and then i'll escape from there and then i in a roll i just do that 10 times in five minutes and i'm getting some good training out of it you know uh I'm not wearing boots and pants, though. I mean, (laughs) wacky. So that's my rant about that. So that particular guru. Um, But yeah, I find it annoying. And I bet, Dan, in academia, this stuff is probably rampant, right? 
It's terrible. It's, well, first of all, it's also even more rampant in uh, traditional martial arts, right? I mean, it's, oh, right. it's basically based on that, right? Mm. I mean, the, the grandmasters are often based on some sort of guru mm. um, personality. Right. Right. And a year, a year ago on this podcast, I told, I, I was thinking again when I knew nothing about the martial art I was in, but it was karate. And it was the grand, they were telling tales of the grandmaster. This will ring a bell for you, I think. They were saying, you know, you learn, he has such body control. And he flicked, a, he told a story of like the grandmaster flicking a kick at someone's groin. It was like, oh boy, you almost hit him in the groin. And he said, I stopped my foot as soon as I felt testicle. <laughs> <laughs> I love that story. That's and it was like this odd, but it made me, I sort of flashed to it when you're saying like, even though I wasn't a karate expert, right. there's certain people like myself who like you hear like, the odd oh in the class and i'm the one in the class going what you're like um <laughs> so the top of your foot has familiarized itself with feeling testicle through karate pants and how fast yeah. can you stop your kick <laughs> like it's just and that's usually when you look around the room and you just maybe catch eye with one other person <laughs> that's like also looking around the room and you're like huh like you give each other that quick look and and then hmm. how soon were you out after that comment Pretty soon. Yeah. I st well, I started looking around. Right. Yeah. I went from there to a boxing gym. Right. No one was talking about stopping their fist. Before they... When it felt my face, <laughs> for one thing. <laughs> I know that they were like... They're accelerating their fist. They were not exercising that level of control. Yeah, they the don't gym. have control. See, when those guys, those boxers who can knock yeah, you out no in control. the gym, when they get out in the street, they're in big trouble. Yeah, because they didn't have the level of control <laughs> they needed. <laughs> That's what I'd say from the mat. <laughs> I'd be on the, my back going, you You'd know. You'd be all groggy and like, yeah. no control. Yeah, yeah you have no control, yeah. <laughs> Boy, that was really bad punch. <laughs> you had no control. Oh, man, that's the best. Yeah. I think I told you that same karate class was when I mounted someone. And it was, I, I knew, I think I'd started jujitsu, but mm. I knew I just physically was able to wrestle a guy down and get on top of him. And I was completely on top of him with like my knees in his armpits. Mm. And he's looking up at me, like on the ground. He can't. He's struggling. He can't get out at all. He knew no jujitsu. And he's like, "Now, if I was allowed to use all the skills at my disposal here, there's a lot of that's the guy at the bottom." He goes, yeah, he's looking up at me from between my knees, and he's like, "And you're pinning his goes, wrist down." Yeah, he it's goes, like, "There's a he goes, there's a lot of shit I could do to you from here." And I'm like, Come on. <laughs> "I'm like, yeah, I wonder if any I could do anything from here." I, yeah, it's like there's not a thing I could do from here. That's so peop, it's a funny. Uh, so, yeah, I'm thinking so traditional martial arts, that sort of guru awe status. Academia has it as well. Uh, you know, these tenured professors who will be like, they'll say things that make no sense at all. Make like, no sense, right? The thing is, sometimes you can say the wackiest stuff. And as long as you have the right, like there was one professor who's just sort of like had this image and he'd be like, I just, what I do is I just teach straight from the book. I just open the book and I talk them through what's in the book. And they'll be like, oh, interesting. And I'm like, wait, isn't that you being a shitty professor? Mm -hmm. Like, aren't you adding are we on no a five second delay all? today, <laughs> Dimitri? I keep cursing. So, I unfortunately, we have that. our usual. Yeah. But you know what I mean? I'm like, but they say it in like this yeah. way that everyone goes, oh, interesting. And I'm like, so you don't prepare anything and you open the book and you teach. That's you're adding no value yeah, at all. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. But it's like you say it in a certain way, and it's yeah. like, oh, that's awesome. Well, the the savvy students realize they don't have to learn any material. They just have to appease this idiot professor to get the grade that they want. You yeah. know, you, you're not there to learn the material. You're there to please the professor. Yeah. If you want a grade, if you want to learn, then you got to learn the material. Yeah. And we've talked about self help gurus too, right? Who a lot of times it's it's almost all presentation and. Yeah, we've talked about important. Tony Robbins on here. Before. Yeah, maybe I could become a guru by being the anti-guru guru. guru. I just rant and rave about gurus, and I people start gurus. following me. You'd have to do it like a guru, though. You'd probably <laughs> have to, you like, do it in the way of everything you're ranting <laughs> against. Like, <laughs> this is what they say wrong. Then, if wrong. anybody calls me out on it, I go exactly. I was just testing you. Yeah, yeah. this is what they do. This is what some of the gurus do wrong. <laughs> well. That's the great thing about live training and um, like uh, Matt Thornton of Straight Blast 
he always talks about that live training and it's just one of those universal truths like if you're training live against resisting people who are legitimately fighting against you you're going to find out some truth some right. answers some objective truth and uh yeah well that's a deep level why i think a lot of us i'll say for myself and i'm sure a lot of people listening like the crowds in a jiu-jitsu or mma gym because there's that filter there's you're faced with the truth like here's what really happens when i go up against someone oh right and it's a filter some people are like oh that's interesting i want to learn this right and there's some people who walk out the door and they say i want to forget i had this experience yeah. i want to i want to go back to talking amnesia. about yeah guru i want to talk about stopping my foot on a testicle or what, whatever <laughs> like i want to get back to what, the what fantasy a, world one of know? our students came in this is a while ago a couple of years ago and he's a law enforcement guy and he was training at some Krav Maga place not to bash Krav Maga but he came in and uh, he rolled and I mounted him and he tried some technique of some sort that really wasn't effective and he's like he can't get out he goes I don't understand I go, what do you mean he goes at Krav Maga they told me to, I should do it like this and then I trap your arm and I roll you over but I can't get your arm I don't understand I go yeah it doesn't work what they told yeah. you doesn't work I go, do they do it against a resisting opponent that knows what they're doing? No. That, so they don't know. I mean, yeah. that live training, consistently live training, is what stress tests your techniques. So if you're not doing that, it's almost sure that your techniques really don't work. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess you could coincidentally train something not against a live opponent and then make it work. I guess it, if the other person had absolutely no skill whatsoever. But... Um, why do it that way? You can do live training. You know what I see now, Dan? I saw this guy on social media, and he's almost a hybrid. So it's almost like a traditional karate guy, and they do katas, but they do kind of Brazilian jiu-jitsu katas. So they do techniques where their partners are cooperating with them. Uh, so it looks like they're doing like kind of fast, flashy jiu-jitsu, but they're not, it's not against a resisting partner. I wonder if those guys can really do something against a resisting opponent i mean not if that's their only training if that's yeah, their only yeah. training maybe that helps a little bit i wonder why they do it that's what i what i don't completely grasp i think that's good for throws like if you're throwing somebody in your takedowns uh sometimes to learn them it's good to work with a uh fast with a cooperating opponent but yeah you gotta you gotta do some live training right yeah, I think without it, you still might learn something that would work against someone who knew nothing. Right. Do you know what I mean? Like if you learn to escape mount, trap an arm, trap the leg, right, and roll them, right, that might still work against in a street or something. You know what I mean? Someone right. that had no idea. That's what like to do. oh, um, our friend Abraham, Abraham, his video when he fought off the the robber yeah. here at the gas station in yeah. Norwood, that that went viral again. It's got like it's seven, viral again. Yeah, it's got like <laughs> seven and a half million views. <laughs> unbelievable and it's the i think it's the channel 25 news they put together a really tight piece where they're showing him in the actual fight and subduing the guy and then they interview him and he just sounds great a new interview or did no just this is the, the one like from two years ago All right. but uh somehow it got hot again and went viral yeah. again and uh somebody posted it on twitter it's and people on the internet are just such fools for the most part it's yeah. unbelievable and some guy uh, said something like somebody posted it. I think they tagged Matt Thornton and they said, uh, you know, jujitsu or martial arts working, check this out or something. And he was kind enough to tag me. But then somebody said, yeah, that's actually wrestling. That's not martial arts, yeah. which is so weird and dopey. Like, first of all, wrestling kind of is a martial art, you yeah. dummy. It's a martial sport. And, um, but what occurred to me and when I watched it all again, because Ibrahim walks around like 122 pounds, and this guy had to be 190 pounds. So, you know, the guy's 50% yeah. larger than him, and he just thrashed the guy and, and choked him unconscious. That he could not have done that without the live training. Oh, no. you know, I mean, if yeah, he didn't train way, yeah. live, that would not have gone down that way. Uh, he would not have been able to choke the guy unconscious and control him and hold sure. him for the police. And it was beautiful because they both basically went away unscathed. I think they both had kind of like a little mouse under their eyes. But that was it, you know. That's that's pretty good, right? Yeah. 
some goon. Is it is it the video with you in it? I have a brief cameo in it. Yeah. So seven and a half million views you got there. Yeah, you, yeah. You would, it'll you, probably be the most viewed moment of your life. I never thought of that. that. Yeah, <laughs> well, seven and a half million. It's Easily. hard to pass that. Right? I should somehow try to get like my. Um, yeah, I don't know. Take advantage <laughs> of that somehow. You would think my dating apps would start blowing up. I don't know. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, yeah, Abraham's the best. He's an awesome guy. But live training, that did it, man. Yep. It works. Um, so I don't know, Dan. Maybe we should wrap it up. I think we've been going pretty good Let's here. Wrap this one up. I think we. Could, what do you think we call this? The anti-guru. I think we covered some good anti-guru stuff, but then we covered some good teaching methodology we're using, and we talked about live training. All good stuff, man. Um, I can't wait for this uh, whole COVID situation to improve even more. Probably get, just get 2022 will be right past, <laughs> right, back. right out the other side of this. There we go. Well, thanks, everybody, for listening. Uh, please subscribe and share this and tell your friends, and we'll talk to you next week. Take care.